Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, we have the extraordinary honor to be joined today by three absolutely incredible women. Dr. Nina Ansari, author and UN Women Global Champion for Innovation. Dr. Mireya Loza, Assistant Professor at NYU. And Christine Platt, author and also Managing Director at American University Anti-Racism Center. Um, I am Salome Bedet. I am one of this year's Teen Advisor co-chairs and I am beyond honored to be here today. Um, welcome everybody. I just want to start with a question for you, Nina. Um, Nina, you wrote Anonymous is a Woman, a global chronicle of gender inequality to amplify the voices of women throughout history. What did you learn about the erasure of women's voices writing this? Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be part of such an amazing panel and to be part of this extraordinary summit of so many inspirational leaders um, and lovely young ladies such as yourself. I What I learned uh, was that really women occupy 0.5% of recorded history. And that is not only a historical inaccuracy, but the repercussions of uh, holding back so many significant contributions that have been made by women for centuries, even during times when women didn't have the kind of opportunities available today, they were able to make invaluable contributions. And the repercussions of that uh, leads to stereotypical, uh, the more we uh, make the invisible visible, that has ripple effects uh, in various forms. One is you're able to shatter stereotypical assumptions, typically in the male-dominated fields, that women are less capable. You're also able to give and provide role models for countless young women because so many studies and research prove that exposure to female role models who have excelled in so many different fields despite the obstacles, specifically during times when women were barred from the educational field, from participating in numerous other fields, um, it has the potential to reap tremendous rewards and benefits. Yeah. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, the next question goes to Christine. Uh, Christine, you have written many children's books centered around African-American stories and voices, especially in this day and age, why do you think children should be exposed to these stories from such an early age? <sighs> so, so, so many reasons. Um, you know, I recently um, read an essay by um, Walter Dean Myers, and it was, it just so beautifully explained um, the importance and significance of, of stories and, and using stories as a way to highlight um, Black narratives that are traditionally um, underrepresented in literature. Um, and I actually have a note here because I really wanted to make sure that I have his quote accurate. And what he said was, um, and the name of this essay, by the way, is um, Where Are the People of Color in Children's Books? Meyer noted that he wrote for Black children to make them human in the eyes of readers, and especially in their own eyes, to make them feel as if they are a part of America's dream and that they are wanted in this country. Um, and I remember reading that and literally having tears in my eyes. Um, it's so adequately captures why I write for children um, and why I think it's so important um, to tell these narratives. And again, um, thinking of the work of um, Rudine um, Sims Bishop, who um, wrote about books being used as windows and mirrors, right? And so when I think of these narratives and, and representation, these books are windows um, for children to look into the lives of, of other um, communities and individuals and narratives that they're curious about, but they're also mirrors um, for my community. Um, and I think it's so important to share those stories and, and making sure that these children see themselves represented on the page. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, thank you so much for that answer. I do believe it is essential for children to be exposed to these stories and voices from such an early age. Mm -hmm. My next question is for Dr. Mireya Loza. Um, Dr. Mireya, I was wondering that you have worked on the Girlhood It's Complicated exhibition. And what can you tell us about the historical importance of girls' voices? Well, you know, I actually think that, you know, like books, museums and exhibitions do a similar kind of work. They actually allow us to see ourselves, to see ourselves as agents of change, to see ourselves as historical actors. And the reality is that many young girls and young people go into museums every single day and they see stories of adults making change, making action, when the reality is that young people have been on the front lines of American history for a very long time. And so what we try to do is to make sure that in a moment and in a year where we're all thinking about women's history, that we actually think about girls as agents of change as well, and that we give girls an opportunity to connect to the past in powerful ways, and so that they see that they are not alone in trying to solve the world's problem, because girls for generations have been doing just that, trying yeah. to solve issues, trying to make a more equitable space for everyone. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing with the world this exhibition of just highlighting girls' um, weight on history because it's often overlooked. Um, this next question goes back to Christine. Christine, mm -hmm. I was wondering, what's your story? How and why did you get started in this storytelling work? Yes, yeah, so my story is I am a first generation um, college grad. Um, and during my studies, um, I studied African and African American history and culture, um, became fascinated by all this bit of history um, about my community that I had never, um, that I had never known. Um, and that's what really drew me to this work, capturing and telling these narratives. Um, and I'm so afraid and so fearful of them being forgotten um, that it's it's really an important part of my work, making sure to capture the narratives of my community, the history, the richness um, and depth of the history of the African diaspora. And now that work has shifted um, into introducing these important narratives to young people um, and starting with early readers, introducing introducing terms like ancestors and you know generational history and all of those things and um, capturing the minds of young people and their imaginations um, earlier with telling these narratives. So that's what led me to this work. Wow, that's so impressive. I would like to extend the same question to Dr. Nina Ansari. What's your story behind how you got involved with this line of work? Wait, I think... Please, doctor. There you go. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. Um, my, I wrote my doctoral thesis on the history of the women's rights movement in Iran. I was born in pre-revolutionary Iran, and I witnessed uh, Iran radically change overnight with the Islamic Revolution of 1979 and with it the rights of the women who were revoked. And during the course of my doctoral research, I uh, came across so many exceptional women in Iran who, despite all the gender discriminatory laws, uh, were able to excel in practically every field. And back then, a lot of their stories uh, were not uh, as part of the mainstream narrative, so to speak. And I felt these women were not only inspirational, but they serve as role models for so many young women in oppressive societies that despite all the roadblocks, you can excel, you can achieve. So that's really how my journey started, was with my academic work. And um, since then, it has extended into the global community where I, during the course of my uh, work as a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics, I came across so many women, like the women in Iran, who have excelled despite the obstacles. And I felt their narratives and their stories should be heard not only because it's important to get their voices out, but also because uh, so many women deserve the recognition that they're not receiving. 
Yes, thank you so much, Nina. And as a last question to Mireya, I was wondering what tips do you have? What advice do you have for girls and young women who want to be storytellers? I think one of my first tips is to actually really look and interrogate the past. We can say or think that we are the first to do something and the first, the first. And one of the things that I love about history is that there has been a long chain of powerful girls, African-American girls, Latina girls, Native girls, all kinds of girls, Asian-American girls that have really fundamentally shifted American history. And I think one of the things to to, to know is that we are not alone and we're not, again, we are not the ones that are the first to have these ideas. And so if we look at the past and we really pull these narratives, we can connect more powerfully to these long histories and say things that young men and boys have always been able to say. I have a history and I can see myself. And so I think, you know, these kind of issues matter, representation matters. And when we see little girls in the 1930s making change, when we see little girls in 1890 making change, when we see them during the American Revolution making change, we know we're just one link in that chain. And we can take lessons from them. We can think about how they connected to community, what tools they used, how they organized, how they actually made communities understand their plight. And so I think that a lot of our questions around social justice can be really guided by these young voices of the past. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for joining this panel today. You have inspired me. I know you have inspired many other attendees. It's been an honor to get to interview the three of you. Um, I actually want to be involved in this line of work right now. So I am very much inspired and thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.